pretty much every tradition was represented. At one time or another, you had a Chinese monk, a Japanese monk, a Korean monk, a Vietnamese monk, a Thai monk, a Sri Lankan monk, uh, a uh, Tibetan monk, all living at the center. And they lived there for free, which is reasonable because monks, first of all, don't have any money. So it's kind of hard for them to pay rent. But they were able to stay there with the understanding that they would teach a class. And the commonly the class they taught was meditation. In the Vietnamese tradition, if you go to visit Vietnamese temples, and if you go to visit Chinese temples, you'll find that they do an enormous amount of chanting. And it, it was said years ago that for the Vietnamese, chanting was the same as meditation. So chanting certainly can be used as meditation. And uh, I can remember a very long time ago somebody asking me how I could chant the Heart Sutra, which was the first thing we did, the Heart Sutra, every day and not become bored. Well, the, the secret behind that is to always chant it for the very first time. And if you can do that, then you never lose interest in it. Uh, it is not a matter, it's not like you were in school and you had to learn a poem and you had to stand up and recite it. My first teacher was Japanese. The only chanting we did with any regularity was that Heart Sutra. We did it before meditation and after meditation. That was it. And to make it even more interesting, it was in Japanese. And to make it even more interesting than that, it was in ancient Japanese, which most of the, the Japanese priests or monks did not understand. It, it was a form of Japanese so old that they had a second translation of it done so that they could study it. They couldn't study the old form. I know that sounds weird or strange to some people, but, uh, you know, that Heart Sutra arrived in Japan in the 6th century. So here they are chanting it now. The idea that the language be the same doesn't work. And uh, if you can't get a handle on that, uh, go to a good library and get... Um, uh, stories of Chaucer, not translated stories, ch the way Chaucer wrote it, and see if you can even figure out what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And if you need something closer to home, read Ben Franklin's autobiography in the original form. And you really, you can figure it out, you, but there was no standard spelling at that time. Mm -hmm. Everything was how that, the writer heard it. So uh, the Heart Sutra in the monasteries in Japan becomes a practice of simply doing. They're not reciting the Heart Sutra for understanding, they're reciting it for doing. Mm -hmm. Years later when I started using an English translation of the Heart Sutra, I found on a regular basis that I would have what we call an opening which is a, like a little teeny tiny bit of enlightenment where I would understand that Heart Sutra. Certainly not the entire thing because everything that is practiced in Buddhism is capitalized. It's in, in, in capitalized in that Heart Sutra. So we have chanting for the sake of chanting as a meditation. We have chanting to become familiar with something, we have the study of the sutras. I used to do a one-day workshop just on that Heart Sutra, that very first thing we did. But we also have other practices, and the pra work is a, is a primary practice in many monasteries, learning how to just work. 
and not be unhappy because we're having to do a certain work, just to simply do the work. Um, there's a lot of confusion about that. Most places that practice Zen don't do much work. They do a little work, but they, they don't understand that the work is just as much a practice as sitting quietly on a cushion meditating. They both have the same value. Dogen Zenji, who brought Zen from China to Japan, would repeatedly tell everyone that you need to do Zazen, which is normally translated as seated meditation, but it would be more accurately to say you need to be actively meditating in everything you do. So I was very surprised when I found out that the monastery that he established in Japan, the very first Zen monastery, they only meditate for three hours a day. And the American impression is, oh, and, it, and it's not just the American impression, it's the impression of people that live in, in Asia, is that monks, real monks, they never, you know, they sit on that cushion until their legs fall off. My doctor one time said to me, don't do too much meditation. I said, what do you mean? He was Chinese. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, they just had a, a monk die in Thailand. He went into meditation, samadhi, and, uh, and he died because his body just stopped being taken care of. He forgot to do things like breathe. So the activities are very, very important. The little chants we do like transference of merit is very, very important. I have one disciple that is a monk, and really he's quite selfish. He's always thinking of himself a lot. He's always wondering what's going to happen to him. He's always hoping that people will make big donations to his temple so he can do the things he wants to do. And so his practice is a practice tailored just to him. And, and the practice he does is known as loving kindness practice where he wishes everyone well in the world. And it's a Theravadan practice, which doesn't make any difference. And uh, so he spends time every morning and every evening wishing that everyone in his family will be well and healthy and happy, that everybody where he lives will be happy and healthy and find their purpose, and it goes all the way down to wishing for your enemies. Now, he doesn't do enemies. I have to remind him, the Tibetans always do that. Tibetans have a saying, your enemies teach you about yourself. And so, at the end of the well, the well wishing of, he calls it metta practice. Metta is loving kindness. And he sticks love in there, which I've never been able to actually find in any traditional thing. May everybody know love. That's not, that's not a traditional thing, but he's desperate to know love, so he put it in there. And so the last thing we do is we wish well, we wish good health and happiness and prosperity to those who hate us. Because we have to remember that if we become hateful and spiteful ourselves, were defeated. Mm -hmm. The Buddha repeatedly said that. Hate can only be turned by love. You, you cannot be changed by hate. So we have to learn to grow a heart full of love. For some people it's a lot of work.